Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. I hope that we find you all safe and well today. I'm so glad that you could join us today for this Fridays with Freelander event. I know this week we have a number of new friends joining us for the first time. This is our sixth Fridays with Freelander event, and if you've missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please email me. I'll be posting my email address in the chat box. Please feel free to send me any questions or comments you may have as well. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. This week, we're very honored to highlight one of our extraordinary expert physician and faculty members of UPMC in the University of Pittsburgh Department of Neurosurgery, Dr. Joseph Maroon. But first, I would like to welcome our Chairman of Neurosurgery, Dr. Robert Friedlander, to give an update of the happenings from last week. Dr. Friedlander, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Justin. And again, I want to welcome you uh, all on this uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, you're really in for a treat uh, today with uh, with Dr. Maroon, and I will be introducing them him at the end of my comments. What I'd like uh, to do, as I do uh, every week, is to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, our week uh, in Pittsburgh and the Department of uh, Neurosurgery, what we've done, and uh, then we'll uh, proceed uh, with uh, Dr. Maroon's uh, talk. So. Um, this uh, week, we've uh, uh, progressed in the care that we've been able to provide our patients. Uh, Pittsburgh is a city, and in in the Allegheny County has turned into a yellow category from a COVID uh, precautionary uh, standpoint. Means uh, obviously, an in between where things have started to, to open up uh, in the city uh, mildly, I would say. Uh, but our hospitals at the UPMC are 100% operational, as I've mentioned that before. I feel uh, very comfortable with saying that uh, they're a very safe uh, place to be, both uh, from uh, the workers as well as for uh, patients and uh, the limited uh, visitors that we can have as, uh, as we're following uh, uh, state uh, guidelines uh, as well. Our patients are all being tested as well as our workers. Everybody coming in gets a questionnaire, um, making sure that they haven't had any COVID uh, contacts, get their temperature. Uh, checked and, and then come into the hospital. Everybody's uh, given a mask where they can wear uh, their own uh, masks. Uh, the number of uh, COVID positive uh, patients in our hospitals have been fairly uh, stable. They really haven't gone down or up uh, uh, very much and they, they range within a pretty uh, narrow uh, window, which is I believe what we will have over the next uh, several uh, months. Obviously, I can't tell if there's going to be a spike or not, but it's hard for their to be even less patients, given that we have a very, very uh, few patients. So uh, we have uh, activated uh, our surgical uh, services. We're taking care of uh, all of our uh, patients, both, uh, I don't like to use the, the word elective because in neurosurgery, really nothing is uh, very much uh, elective, uh, but it's uh, scheduled and certainly the urgent and emergent uh, cases. Uh, every patient that wishes uh, to be tested uh, for COVID-19 can get a test. Uh, which again, it's uh, very helpful given the data that's out there that even if you're uh, pre-symptomatic uh, from a COVID uh, uh, stance, uh, general anesthesia could be harmful uh, for you as well as uh, put the, the health healthcare workers at, the, at uh, some danger of a, of a spread of a, uh, COVID-19. So again, the fairly uh, important thing uh, to do is completely elective if the patients don't want to have uh, the testing done, they don't uh, certainly don't have uh, uh, to have it, particularly for nurse, for most neurosurgical uh, uh, procedures. But uh, uh, the one uh, aspect which I, I keep mentioning uh, every day is that there's a balance between coming into the hospital and uh, not uh, coming in and seeking care when you have symptoms and new symptoms. So again, I urge uh, everybody uh, that's uh, listening uh, to make sure that if you're symptomatic, you have new symptoms, uh, you have any uh, complaints, uh, even for established or new patients, to make sure that uh, reach out to us. We're doing quite a bit of uh, care through our, our telemedicine uh, platforms, which have been incredibly helpful. And I'm sure telemedicine is here to stay from uh, for us to be able to provide uh, care in a comfortable and safe uh, uh, situation. Now, uh, pivoting into our department, as I've uh, mentioned uh, before, one of the luxuries that we have in being the absolute largest department of neurosurgery uh, in the country, particularly upon, among uh, leading academic centers, but uh, for the uh, overall really the largest uh, department is that we can be 
very, very subspecialized as we've had in the previous uh, iterations of uh, this uh, this uh, program. Um, a number of our uh, subspecialists and uh, clinical leaders who themselves attract uh, patients not only regionally and nationally, but from all over the world uh, to be able to speak uh, to you uh, during uh, this event. Uh, today, I am uh, uh, honored and uh, delighted uh, to introduce uh, uh, my friend and uh, mentor, uh, and really a legend among uh, neurosurgeons. Uh, uh, you know, the, 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 there's a joke uh, you know, when people uh, say it's not brain surgery that all the you know brain surgeons have uh, big egos and uh, and all of that. And uh, I, I I won't comment if we do or or we don't. But uh, for us to be able to look up uh, to people, it's a it's a it's very special. And uh, Dr. Uh, Joe Maroon is certainly one of these uh, li larger than life. Uh, uh, individuals uh, who is loved by uh, so many and uh, respected and again it's been a mentor and an advisor to me over the many years particularly uh, over these uh, past uh, 10 years that I have uh, uh, been in uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, Dr. Uh, Maroon has uh, uh, won many many awards. He's a, a past president of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons. Uh, uh, he's the neurosurgeon uh, to the Steelers. Uh, and uh, again, really is a man uh, that uh, has uh, so many uh, accolades and uh, so many uh, uh, things that he's done. Uh, he's a humanitarian. He cares about our residents as an, as an example. He donates from his own the funds uh, to buy them healthy food for them to have uh, in their in their uh, in their rooms, uh, as well as he donated a, a gym for the residents as, as an example. So again, really a fantastic. Uh, uh, individual, you're in uh, for a treat uh, uh, today, and uh, again, like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Maroon, and uh, please uh, uh, take it over. Wow, thank you so much, Robert. That's an incredible introduction. Uh, you know, the title of my talk today is "The Secret to Balance and Resilience in Any Pandemic," and given what we're all going through now with a forced confinement. How many of you, in terms of your financial and health concerns, have experienced ex increased stress, depression, anger even, uh, and, and have had significant emotional problems with this severe confinement that we have? A recent study out of uh, California with the Kaiser Group reports that over 50% of, of individuals in the United States have now significant mental health issues and or new or exacerbated by the confinement and the financial and health concerns. Uh, what I'm going to do today, there's, there's a statement that data tells and stories, data, data tells and stories sell. I'm going to share with you some data, data on burnout, data on stress, uh, the physiological consequences thereof, homeostasis, and then the story I'm going to tell you is a personal story of my own, my own struggles, if you would, with success, in quotes, uh, the vagaries of success, uh, and the consequential burnout and subsequent rather severe depression uh, that I will illustrate for you and, and then tell you some of the lessons I've learned and get back to being the presumptuous title of the secret to balance and resilience in any pandemic. So what I would like to do now is uh, just fairly quickly go through an overview of the mental health problems that are associated with the pandemic. And, and as I said in my title, any pandemic, any crisis is a pandemic when you're in it. Anxiety, fear, anger, depression, burnout, all of these are common common phenomena that we're all seeing, particularly in healthcare workers. Burnout is epidemic among doctors and, and healthcare workers. Emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, cynicism. I we, we see this at times when individuals get overwhelmed, overcommitted, overstressed. They become cynical, sometimes act out with anger, and then have, what am I doing here? Uh, low sense of personal accomplishment. And, and burnout is something that is now epidemic, not only in the healthcare profession, in lawyers and professionals, and, and in so many people because of 
the the confinement and the personal concerns we have. And with that introduction, I want to discuss with you my own personal story as an example of uh, what can happen uh, in the pursuit of success. When I first finished my residency over 100 years ago, uh, it seems like that, I, uh, I came to the University of Pittsburgh at the request of Peter Janetta, the chairman at the time, and I was appointed the chief of neurosurgery here at the leading hospital in the country. Uh, I was doing very nice research that got significant acclaim. And then I was actually appointed to be the first consultant in neurosurgery in the NFL and to the Pittsburgh Steelers with Mr. Dan Rooney. And I was really uh, literally flying high. And I'll explain in just a minute why I use that term, flying high. Uh, and after five or six years, which is not uncommon in most, in many professions, uh, the success and, and you're flying high, uh, catastrophe struck. There was a major train wreck in my life. Uh, my father died prematurely at age 60 of a heart attack. Uh, my wife uh, left in the middle of winter with our two children uh, for justifiable reasons. And the stress was so overwhelming that I had to quit neurosurgery. I literally was in, I was operating one day and and found that I, I had very difficult time completing the operation, had to ask for help, walked out of the hospital, and I didn't realize if I had ever returned and how long it might take to get back. One day I was doing awake brain surgery on patients, uh, talking to them while removing tumors, and uh, literally the next week, all of that happened in the, the course of a week, my wife, my father, and quitting neurosurgery, I moved into this farmhouse in Dallas Pike, West Virginia with my mother uh, in the middle of winter and then helped her uh, in this truck stop that was bequeathed to her by my father, dilapidated, heavily mortgaged, and uh, ended up filling up 18 wheelers, flipping hamburgers and, uh, and wondering, you know, how did this happen? Am I ever going to get out of this? And, and this quote from Sir James Barry really summarizes it well. The life of every man is a diary in which he means to write one story and sometimes writes another. His humblest hour is when he compares it with the volume as it is, with what he vowed to make it. I certainly didn't consider myself uh, to be working in a truck stop the rest of my life, but I had no idea how I got there and how to get out of it. And we'll discuss that. Uh, and I came across this recent quote that was so powerful. Uh, John Cagg is a philosopher at the University of Massachusetts who's recently written some excellent books. And he said, most of modern life is geared towards attaining success. So what do we mean by success in this world? Power, prestige, money, status. Only after it is attained does its hollowness became, become painfully aware. And I certainly became painfully aware of that. So the question is, and to, to quote Macbeth and, and, and Shakespeare, you know, how does one minister to a mind diseased, pluck from memory some rooted sorrow and raise the written troubles of the mind? I was befuddled. I had no idea what to do until the banker who held the mortgage to the truck stop called and said, hey, Joe, let's go for a run. I think he wanted to see if I'd be around long enough to pay off the mortgage. Overweight, dysmic, uh, terribly depressed. I said, no way, I can't do it. But somehow we managed four laps around this track in Tridelphia, West Virginia. And that night I said, never again. But I, I slept for the first time in three months. And the little light bulb went off and I said, maybe, you know, I should try this again. The next day, I ran a mile and a quarter, walked a mile and a quarter, and then subsequently two, three, four. And I started realizing my depression was beginning to lift. My appetite was becoming more geared to healthy foods. And, and I started to feel even a little slightly better, can see the blue beneath, beneath the gray clouds in the sky. And I learned to swim. I, I learned to bike and cross train. And I, I realized that exercise was an incredibly important key 
to my equilibrium, to my equanimitas, if you would. And, and I subsequently continued to run, bike and swim until four years ago with Heinz Ward. Uh, he and I competed in the Hawaiian Ironman Triathlon, which is a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and then a marathon through the uh, lava fields in, in Hawaii. I, I told Heinz I was gonna kick his butt, but unfortunately, uh, he did win. This is a swim start. I'm way in the back there, but uh, I was able to finish uh, under the 17 hour limit. And unfortunately, Heinz beat me by about 45 minutes. Uh, so that's, a, that's an interesting story. And it, it kind of sets the stage for a lot of reflection I've done over the last several years. And you're all familiar with the story of Icarus, uh, who was imprisoned by King Minnow with his father, Daedalus, the greatest architect in ancient Greece, who fashioned wings made of feathers and wax. And he cautioned his son about when they escaped out of the, out of the labyrinthine prison, when he experienced flight, he might want to soar too high with his newfound talent and successes and be careful not to fly too near the sun, lest the wings melt, the wax melt, and you plummet into the sea, nor fly too low, lest the waves pull your feathers down and, and you sink into the sea. In other words, this is the first story that I could find about the Aristotelian seeking the mean between extremes, hitting balance, seeking balance in your life. So what do we mean by balance when life threatens? Uh, Tom Morris wrote this excellent book, uh, in tragedy, it's difficult to be hopeful. In triumph, it's hard to be humble. You know, it's, it's remarkable that in the locker room after each game, Coach Tomlin actually quotes this. He tells his, his team in, in defeat, remember, don't forget to be hopeful, but in victory, remain humble. Every game, he, he picks one of these to say. So I was very impressed in the past with the Stoicism, the Stoic art of living, and, and three of my heroes, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, and Seneca, all 2,000 2, years ago, who, who really had their philosophy summarized by the, the, uh, the Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl, in his book, Man's Search for Meaning. He said, we have absolutely no control over what happens to us in life, we have paramount control over how we respond to these events. It's our response that we somehow must get under control. And, and then I was fascinated by these three other gentlemen who really discussed balance. Claude Bernard was a physiologist in France in 1865 who described the milieu interior. And he said the stability of the interior environment of our bodies is the condition for a free and independent life. Walter Cannon, a physiologist at Harvard, discussed the concept of homeostasis, how all of our organs work together, our kidneys, our liver, our heart, all work within a certain spectrum of safety in terms of our temperature, our electrolyte balance, our blood sugar, to keep us in a state of homeostasis. And he described the concept of fight or flight. And then Hans Selye, uh, talked about the adaptation syndrome and really correlated the consequences of stress relative to our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. In other words, how our endocrine system responds to stress and the physiological consequences in the relationship to cancer, heart disease, stroke, ulcers. And then finally, the, the new field, relatively new, of psychoneuroimmunology. We've all heard of the mind-body connection. This is psychoneuroimmunology, how stress affects our immune system. In this time of pandemics, we're, we're all aware of the elderly and those who have suppressed immune system be more, being more susceptible uh, to stress, less able to handle it. And it's because of the relationship uh, of suppression of our immune system with stress, depression, uh, and, and uh, anxiety. So uh, 
another one of my heroes, uh, William Danforth, who wrote a book, I Dare You. He was the founder of the Rolson Purina Checkerboard Square Company, and was a big proponent of health to the youth of America. And uh, in his book, Danforth uh, stated, I dare you to live a balanced life. And this is something I want all of you listening to really draw it out on a piece of paper now, your own square, work, relationships, spirituality, and physical. And then he said, I want you, the reader, to draw a line commensurate with how much effort you put into each one of these in your daily life. And when I sat down in that farmhouse and drew my square, it looked like the bottom. It was a straight line EKG, all work. My relationships were completely uh, gone. Uh, there was virtually no spirituality and, and the physicality was absent. And I realized by simply looking at this nomogram, if you would, I, I was clearly my, my pursuit of success to the neglect of everything else in my life is what really resulted in the burnout situation I found myself, my lack of resilience and my inability to cope. And I, I decided to look at each one of these sides of the square and I'm going to rather quickly go through the physical and nutritional side of the square, the, the, the relationship, the spiritual and the physical. So when we look at the physical side, we, we know what exercise does to the body in terms of strengthening your bone, blood pressure, decreased weight, and, and help improve sleep. As I, as I found as the first, first uh, uh, discovery in my way back, if you would. But what most people are unaware of, if what exercise does to your brain, what happens in the brain? It's not just psychological. One of the most important things, there's a release of the neurotropic factor, BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. What does this do? Number one, it creates new brain cells, neuronogenesis. It creates new connections between the brain cells, synaptogenesis, in which it's the synapses, synaptose connections where memory is encoded, and it increases your ability of brain plasticity, of healing the brain despite the, the vicissitudes and the trauma that occurs. And also it re rearranges your, your transmitters. What's the most common drug prescribed in the world? Uh, your serotonin reuptake inhibitors to increase your serotonin. What's the most effective way to do that? By exercise. And I, I emphasize this to all of you listening, the exercise cure. It's significantly better in lessening symptoms of depression compared to antidepressant drugs. Many, many studies have now been done comparing exercise to, uh, to, to serotonin reuptake inhibitors and other antidepressants, and exercise wins almost every time. Quickly to discuss the concept of epigenetics. You know our genes are located on chromosomes, and really they're like a blueprint that do not do much until they're acted upon. Those factors that act upon the genes that tell the genes what proteins to make are called epigenetic factors. These are the four main epigenetic factors. If you eat a Big Mac infused with hormones and antibiotics raised in a cattle lot, fed corn from Iowa, red, <laughs> raised on glyphosate, you're going to activate through transcription factors your genes to make inflammatory agents, and you know that inflammation is the common cause of cancer, heart disease, stroke, arthritis, and depression. Exercise the same thing in a polluted environment and emotional health and stress all activate genes in an adverse way to result in inflammation and severe consequences to our body. In contrast to a healthy diet, calorie restriction, exercise, clean air, and emotional, uh, emotional control, and positive relationships. All of these are essential. Those people in areas that have the most uh, centenarians all 
activate their epigenetic factors with a healthy diet, hard work, clean environment, and strong family units, and also prayer. Prayer meditation uh, is huge in reducing stress and inflammation in our bodies. So on the spiritual side of the square, I'm not here to proselytize in any way. However, uh, I've been very impressed with uh, the spiritual practices. I grew up Roman Catholic. Uh, and uh, one of the things that happened is I, I clearly got pretty far away from that uh, on my, my pursuit of success. And uh, the, the purpose of spiritual practices is to gain perspective, really, on the purpose of our lives. And, and this defi these definitions are, are really pretty profound. Religion is about answers, uh, whether it's the Judeo Christian, uh, Islam, uh, Tao, Confucianism, Buddhism, Hinduism, they all provide answers to how you should live in a society, how you should interact with individuals. Spirituality is more about questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? What happens when I die? How should I live? You know, what's it all about, Alfie? What am I here for? And, and Solzhenitsyn said it very well. He said, we've placed too much hope in political and social reforms, amen, uh, only to find we're being deprived of our most precious possession, our spiritual lives. And Taleb said it even more succinctly, it's not that we need to believe that God is great, only that God is greater than us. So, and, and Robert Burns said it well, the purpose of life is a life of purpose. That's what we all struggle with on a day. What is our purpose? How should we carry it out? And then to look at the work side of the square, uh, I go back to Selye, his superb book, Stress Without the Stress. All of us at some times are overstressed, physically and mentally. The thing is, stress is good for us. Selye describes eustress, which means good stress and distress. And there is a parabolic curve. We need stress to make our muscles stronger, our heart stronger, our brains work better. But there's an optimal level and the whole key is trying to is to have what the Buddhists say, mindfulness or awareness of our stress level. Where are we in our stress level? When does the you stress become distress? So why do I show this tachometer? Every day when I get into my, my automobile, I look at my tachometer. I take about 30 seconds to look at the gray zone and the red zone and take a, a mental check of how much stress I'm under. How do I feel? The mindfulness, the awareness that I had no inkling of when I, when I went through my, my, my own burnout session. I was totally unaware of my activity level, what I was doing, ignoring individuals that were trying to help me and overlooking the important things in life. And you can, you have to stay out of the red zone. Once you get into the red zone, that's the, when your engine's overheated and you are going to burn out. You must avoid that, but you must be aware of that. And that's an inner awareness that, that you, you really have to think about. So uh, on the relation side of the square, you know, after, after getting involved with triathlons, which I, I still am involved with, uh, and I, I thought, you know, again, what's it all about? And I ask you in the audience listening today, I'm going to pose the question to you. What are the three most important things in your life? Think about it for 10 seconds before I show you what my response to that is. And my response is there are three things that are most important. Number one, your physical and your mental health. Absolutely essential. Without that, uh, we have very little. Number two is relationships with God, family, friends, and colleagues. And number three is carpe diem, seize the day. It is so important. I see the bullets every day going by my own head, my friends, my colleagues, my associates, 
who come down with terrible diseases or terrible accidents or, or suddenly pass away. So very, very important to work on these three things consciously daily. And, and I, I have to go back to my Greek friends, Heraclitus. Uh, he said, you can never put your foot into the same river twice. You know, why can you not put your foot into the same river twice? There is nothing permanent except change, he says. What does this have to do with the brain, which I immediately related to our brain and our connectome? So what is the connectome? It's the wiring diagram of our brain with incredibly sophisticated imaging now. We're able to see the connections in our brain, the thousands and millions of synaptic connections and wiring diagrams, the tracks, that connect us, that make us who we are. It's called the connectome. And there are epigenetic factors beginning in utero that affect the wiring diagram of our brain. Genetics, maternal health, diet, environmental factors, sleep, toxins, drugs, alcohol, uh, marijuana, uh, other drugs that literally affect the wiring diagram and can do so for, for many, many years. The good and positive thing though is our human brain has amazing neuroplasticity, the ability to repair itself. We see this all the time in head trauma, in brain tumors that have caused damage and the amazing recovery that individuals can make. Our brain is neuroplastic and with retraining, it can gain again the function that it had in the past. Uh, the, uh, and, and again, there's nothing new <laughs> that we find in medicine. Uh, in Proverbs 23, 7, 3,000 years ago, uh, David said, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he shall be. What does this have to do with neuroplasticity? What it has to do is that our thoughts literally get rewiring and wired in our brains. What we think literally changes the physical connections of our brain. There was a physiologist by the name of Donald Hebbs in 1949 who said, neurons, nerve cells that fire together, wire together. Whether it's practicing your golf swing or whether it's developing new habits or relearning habits, it's using the neurons to fire together and they get wired together to form new habits. And, uh, and then in, in conclusion, uh, you know, I've, I've taken, in my, taken care of in my career, many thousands of patients with broken necks and backs and heads and broken bodies and fractures therein. I've also experienced the fractures that occur to psyches, to my own psyche and to many, many people that, that I know who have gone through incredible mental, emotional, spiritual uh, hardship and depression. And, and you recall in, Meth, in Macbeth, uh, Lady Macbeth and Macbeth the soldier had plotted to kill King Duncan and they did so that they could be king and queen of Scotland, but they had incredible remorse and what would be described today as PTSD. And Macbeth approached the doctor and he said, doctor, how does one minister to a mind diseased, pluck from memory some rooted sorrow, raise out the written troubles encoded in the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse the bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon her heart. And the doctor said, therein the patient must minister to himself. And what, what I've tried to do in this talk by sharing data with you about burnout, by sharing my own personal story, by discussing with you the physiological consequences of stress, how it affects the body, and also by example, uh, the, 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 the way that exercise diet uh, can impact our brains 
to result in rewiring of the connections that sometimes get broken or or disassembled and how in our case in my case in your case the patient indeed can minister to himself and all of that is summarized in the book square one a simple guide to a balanced life that my good friend sanjay gupta uh, from cnn uh, said this book has already changed me uh, he was very instrumental in me putting this together and summarizing for you uh, what I just shared in this talk. So thank you very, very much. Thank you and, so much, uh, Dr. Maroon. What a truly inspirational presentation, life and career that you've had. <clears throat> We're gonna begin the, with our Q&A portion of our presentation. Um, we'll try and answer as many questions as we can in our allotted time. I know Dr. Friedlander has a quick question. Go ahead, Dr. Friedlander. Uh, thank you, Justin and uh, Joe. Really uh, uh, fantastic, uh, inspirational, and thank you for sharing, uh, uh, you know, your private moments and your lowest moments in your life, and how that this has been so important for you and has made you the person that that you are uh, currently. Um, you talk a lot about um, balance, and going back to you know, we we started the talk. I started, and you did with. Uh, with uh, the impact of this pandemic on society. And clearly being in quarantine has uh, positive uh, aspects uh, from a disease point of view, although some of them are debated uh, by uh, experts, but clearly it's, it's flattened uh, the, the curve, but it's gotta have some uh, very negative uh, uh, you know, implications for, for the balance that, that you're talking about. And a society is uh, contemplating, and you know, politicians in general, how to open up society again. You know, we're weighing the pluses and the minuses of, of whatever it will do to the disease and contagion and so on and so forth. But that has to be weighed against, you know, closing up the economy, uh, people losing jobs, and all the, uh, uh, you know, negatives that this uh, will have. Can you? Tell me how you would think about that and, and the balance and how would you advise? Uh, hopefully we'll have some uh, politicians at some point that would listen to you uh, on, on what to do with, uh, with, uh, with society at this point. Well, well, thank you, Robert. The way I see it at this point is the people that really need to be protected most are the elderly, uh, the very young and those who are immunosuppressed. And I think the, uh, the complete closing down of everything for a prolonged period of time clearly has indeed, as the goal was to flatten the curve. So the curve, I think, has been flattened. I mean, as you said in your preamble, uh, here in Western Pennsylvania, uh, there's a marked reduction in the incidence uh, in the new cases. Uh, and in, in West Virginia, I know there were only 13 cases in the whole state uh, within the past day or two. So we have flattened the curve. And now I think with the precautions that can be taken with social distancing, masks, washings of hands, I, I think it is time to start to get back uh, to people so that, I mean, the financial, the financial hardships that have been incurred, the people that are going to go bankrupt in small businesses, the, and the healthcare providers, who, who have struggled through this in such a difficult way. I, I think we really must get back to opening the, econ the economy with protecting those that are most vulnerable uh, as best we can. Thank you. Before I turn it back on uh, to Justin, the, the, these are all very, very important points. I mean, we have to be strategic about uh, protecting the vulnerable, the elderly, uh, clearly the vast majority of uh, mortality has occurred in uh, individuals over 80 and 85. Um, so it's, it's uh, really, really uh, important. I'm very uh, proud of our uh, system here at the UPMC that uh, clearly we've uh, uh, been able to open our doors to take care of everybody. We've been taking care of uh, people from other states where they can't uh, seek uh, care uh, at uh, this point. So all very, very uh, important words. Uh, Justin, well, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to uh, address uh, the questions of the, from the audience. Thank you both. Uh, we have a ton of questions, so we'll try to get to as many as we can here. Uh, Dr. Maroon, what are some 
first clues or symptoms of burnout that people should watch for so that action can be taken to prevent it from progressing? I think what I've seen and what I've experienced is there's a slight change in personality and individual's reaction to what may be minor stress. Uh, there's, there's more anger at times, there's acting out, there's uh, uh, language becomes uh, uh, much looser, uh, and then it's a feeling of anxiety uh, and feeling out of control. As, as we said in the initial slide, there's depersonalization. I just don't feel, I don't understand what's going on. I'm tired. I'm physically exhausted. I'm emotionally exhausted. Uh, I'm somewhat cynical, more so than I, I should be. And I don't feel like my, worth is, my, my work is, uh, is as satisfying as it used to be. These are all yellow flags, warning signs, if you would, that again, you must be aware of the downward slope. Too many people, including me, <laughs> get to the point of, of, of falling off the cliff and then wondering, you know, what happened? How did I get there? And I go back every day. I, I still, I, when I get up in the morning, I, I, number one, I say, thank you, God, carpe diem. Everything works. I'm getting out of bed and I can move. Uh, and, number, and then number, the second thing I do, what am I going to do to touch base on the personal side, my social and family side? Call, call my family, call my daughters, call my friends, touch base with them in some way, the people very close to me. The spiritual side is critical. As a physician, we're very blessed to be able to interact with patients. In, an air, in a time when, when you know, there, there, there's the saying, there's, there's no atheist in a foxhole. When people are about to be wheeled in a gurney, in to have a brain surgery or spine surgery, everyone is open to help from outside sources. Uh, and, and to pray with a patient before they're going into the operating room, I can't tell you the people who have been appreciative of that without proselytizing a particular religion. And, and then the physical side, every day, I'm going to get an hour in of something, walking, biking, a swim, something to maintain my physical balance. So it's again, it's a conscious effort to work on your square <laughs> and look at your tachometer on a daily basis. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. Uh, next question here. Patients that are physically fit generally have better surgical outcomes. Do you think this needs to be discussed more often? No question about it. There's, there's actually studies that have been done measuring the immune response to stress and and patients who go who go into surgery extremely fearful apprehensive uh, terrified they're not going to come out i quite frankly i i have in the past refused to operate on patients like that i, I had a case many years ago a patient with a brain tumor uh, a benign brain tumor an older patient and she told me the night before, doctor, I don't think I'm going to wake up. My, my husband died recently and I don't think I want to wake up. I said, no, 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 no. And sure enough, it was a perfect operation. Nothing went wrong. And she did not wake up. And I, I feel the mind body connection is so powerful that whatever we can do, uh, prayer, reassurance, education to reduce anxiety, uh, which which suppresses our immune system, the psychoneuroimmunology that I talked about, is absolutely critical to good outcomes in, in, in patients. Great, thank you. Uh, there has been more interest recently in nutrient therapy, such as a high dose vitamin and mineral supplementation, promoting supplements for improving emotional, psychological, in psychosocial health. Do you envision future research at, at the University of Pittsburgh to prove efficiency of nutrient therapies and also prayer and spiritual principles of healing? Yes, uh, I, I have to say that here at the University of Pittsburgh, we have an excellent complementary medicine department uh, headed by Dr. Glick, uh, who is an absolute 
professional and extremely well educated in this. And we need to start looking not just at the at the complete blood count and the uh, and, and the electrolytes uh, in our in our workups. We need to look at the nutrient levels and also our microbiome. Uh, these are extremely important. The, the microbiome in particular, the gut health, the organisms in our intestinal tract, there's a clear cut gut brain connection. The, the bacteria in our gut have a profound effect on the neurochemicals and the neurotransmitters in our brain. And we're just now starting to look at how diet and microbiome uh, affects the functioning of, of, of our brain and also in anxiety and depression. So these are all areas that we're looking at here at the University of Pittsburgh, and particularly in the Center of Compl Complementary Medicine. Uh, that same person said, thank you for a great presentation, Dr. Maroon. So just a nice comment there. Uh, Dr. Maroon, the next question here, in the time of COVID, there's been a lot of discussion taking place about resilience. Several social scientists make a strong case for the role of fulfillment in how we manage and experience stress and hardship. Do you personally tie fulfillment to purpose? Is there a neuroscience explanation for why finding fulfillment is so critical to our resilience? No question. Uh, an excellent question. What is resilience? Resilience is the ability to rebound or recover from a stressful situation. You know, Cellier spoke about the adaptation syndrome. The first response is, is alarm and then resistance and then exhaustion. So in, in terms of resilience, you know, what, what helps it, resilience is, is the purpose uh, and, and also relevance. It's terribly important to remain relevant in, in what you're doing and, and how you're contributing. There's a saying that we give but little when we give of our possessions. It's when we give of ourselves that we truly, truly give. What does it mean to give of yourself? Well, it's, it's, it's giving back. It's, it's sharing your, your knowledge, your resources, uh, educating and being empathetic and, and, and willing to help others. Uh, that's why the healing professions are so rewarding and, and it's so essential that we don't get cynical and that we don't, that we avoid burnout despite the incredible stresses that we, that, that we encounter. So yes, it's all, it's all immunologically uh, uh, and, and physiologically related to our stress response. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. Uh, when did you decide to return to neurosurgery after your burnout? It took a full year. I, I was terribly apprehensive. I felt that I, I was completely out after. It's amazing how fast things move in our field and keeping up. And, and I was apprehensive, but I actually thought of staying in Bridgeport, Ohio. Uh, but my mother at the time literally uh, kicked me out and said, you cannot stay here. Uh, you have to go back. Uh, you, you spent 20 years getting an education to doing what you're doing and uh, you have a responsibility to go back. And reluctantly I did and uh, I, I was able to enter really the very best part of my life with a much deeper appreciation for not only the the physical fracturing and fractures that I took care of, but also a much, much deeper appreciation of the fractured psyches and, and the, the mental problems that people are confronting. And, and again, that the profound statement of, of Shakespeare, how does one minister to a mind diseased and, and pluck from memory some rooted sorrow and raise the written troubles of the mind. And when you put that in the context of the connectome in, in our 21st century, it's amazing how prescient uh, Shakespeare was discussing mental health. 
Excellent. Thank you. Uh, you are an amazing and dedicated athlete. Can you talk about how surgery is physically demanding and how important physical fitness is for surgeons? Yes, another extremely important question. Again, to, to, work, to work optimally, one has to be in balance, physically, mentally, spiritually. You cannot be overwhelmed by, by going through a divorce, by a child's problems with drugs, by the things that can insert themselves into our own psyche and impair our performance. And for me, and for many, uh, physical activity, as I showed on the slide, resets our, neuro, our neurochemicals. Uh, the, the problems with, with serotonin getting depleted and, and BDNF creating new neurons, all of this results from aerobic activity, uh, strengthening and aerobic activity. So it rebalances your neurotransmitters, your, your psyche, and, and enables you to handle the vicissitudes that encounter all of our lives on an everyday basis and function, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a minister, a rabbi, uh, whatever your profession, to work to, to seek optimal performance. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. How do people with a known inherited condition or disease and chronic pain cope well? <laughs> Excellent question. And that, that includes an awful lot of people in this country with, with spinal disorders, with, with uh, again, with chronic intractable pain. Um, and, and that, first of all, you know, using all of the modern adjuncts of medicines, uh, medicines can take you so far. Many, many practitioners in pain clinics now are advocating meditation. And again, prayer is literally a form of meditation uh, and mind control. And again, mind over body whenever possible. And it's easy for me to say that now until you have, until you own your own toothache acts up. But uh, I think working with with all of the healthcare providers, your psychologist, your psychiatrist, your your priest, your rabbi, your minister, uh, and your pain specialist, a physician, be it an anesthesiologist, a neurosurgeon, a psychiatrist. Uh, sometimes it takes a full court press, but clearly it can be done. Great, thank you. Um, I'm a proud supporter of UPMC and Pitt Neurosurgery. What makes, motivates you to make generous donations to the department? So I've been a visiting professor many, many universities across the United States, from Harvard to UCLA and many others. So I've had the opportunity to visit, to visit programs, neurosurgical programs, hospitals and institutions. And the reason I'm, I'm still here, quite frankly, I've I'm, uh, I won't say exactly how old, but let's just say I'm a septuagenarian. And, and the reason I still love coming to work here at UPMC is because of the, the dedication to excellence, the fact that the individuals here are of incredible quality, uh, committed, and all with the right commitment to helping others, to giving to others, uh, not just monetarily, but to giving to others from themselves what they've learned, and also an extremely compassionate environment, working with the nurses in this institution, as well as the physicians. And, and I see my own friends, my colleagues hospitalized here. The compassion that's, that's ubiquitous is something that's contagious. It's a good working atmosphere. And, you know, I don't ever intend to uh, retire, so to speak. Uh, I want to stay as relevant as long as I can. I want to continue to contribute in whatever way I can financially as well as uh, uh, educationally. Uh, so, and as, as Robert, as Dr. Friedlander said earlier, you know, we have over 25 neurosurgeons, thousands of healthcare professionals in the neurosciences. And, and also uh, working incredibly diligently in terms of research and then converting that research 
into clinical application. So it's it's just an exciting area and an exciting place uh, to be spending time in. Excellent. Uh, kind of a fun question here. As the Steelers neurosurgeon, who was your <laughs> favorite Steeler over your time? <laughs> oh, I, I've had I've had many, many of them. Uh, I mean, depending on what qualities. Uh, Jack Lambert was 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 a clearly a favorite, and Franco. Uh, ben is just an incredible competitor, and uh, the people that we have on the team now, Alejandro Villanueva. Uh, you talk about somebody who's balanced and who's been through hell, and and has come back and is an incredible educator. Uh, and and I mean, we we have a, and most importantly, I I would compliment from the top, Art Rooney formerly Dan Rooney, uh, the Steeler staff. It's a family. It's a Steeler family. And it's kind of like the, you know, I'm so blessed. I, I belong to the neurosurgical family here at the University of Pittsburgh and my other family uh, outside of my own personal family are the Steelers. Uh, it starts from the top. The leadership starts from the top. And uh, it's just an organization based on fairness, on uh, reward, uh, and the gratification comes from winning and the lessons that come from losing are all uh, available to me. And, and again, I thank God every day for that opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. Uh, it's 1.57. I think we could be here another hour with uh, questions for you, Dr. Maroon. Um, I'm going to give you one more here and we'll try and get to as many afterwards as we can. Um, you've had an amazing career. What has been one of the most memorable moments? The most memorable moments. That's a tough one. I, I would have to say. Um, that's a tough one. I, I would have to say operating on on quite a few professional athletes with career ending injuries that as a team we've been able with John Norwig, the head trainer of the Steelers, who's just a magnificent individual. Uh, and Tony Yates and Jim Bradley uh, get players back to their to their what they love and what their livelihood and also working with the World Wrestling Entertainment. Uh, we, we've operated on many of the professional wrestlers who are also incredible human beings and uh, uh, just great to work with great individuals. So again, the field of sports medicine has been very good to me. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. Thank you for everything. Like I said, we could be here another hour with questions. Uh, I apologize if we couldn't get to all of them, but I want to throw it back to Dr. Friedlander to wrap us up for the day. Thanks again, Dr. Maroon. I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, uh, Justin and uh, Dr. Maroon. Really uh, inspirational and uh, in fantastic uh, talk. And uh, your talk uh, uh, reminds me of uh, the breadth and depth of our department. I've spoken before of us being the largest and how subspecialized our uh, practitioners are, uh, particularly on the clinical uh, side. But if we think of also uh, the research side and as we put our whole department uh, together, we truly take care of the whole individual from, uh, you know, Dr. Maroon's uh, talk really exemplifies uh, evaluating and the spiritual aspects of it. I've seen him in the in the preoperative area uh, holding the hands of his uh, patients and praying uh, uh, with them. I mean, what what, what an individual uh, Dr. Maroon uh, is. But then really going throughout our whole uh, department and different people are really world experts and world leaders in so many different ways from uh, traumatic brain and spine injury from uh, uh, management of uh, brain tumors, really uh, developing new therapies uh, for our patients, uh, where our department really uh, is not satisfied by do by status quo. Um, we really want to be not only the best of the best, but lead the way in uh, in innovation. And it's uh, again uh, seeing uh, Dr. Maroon's uh, talk today uh, really exemplifies uh, that our. Speaker for uh, next uh, week is Dr. Jorge Gonzalez uh, Martinez, really uh, the nations, if not the world's uh, preeminent epilepsy uh, neurosurgeon. I'll be talking about uh, his uh, experience. Uh, it'll be a fantastic uh, talk. So I would 
really want to close up by thanking uh, Dr. Maroon for sharing so much uh, of uh, himself and his experiences and helping uh, so many uh, people, both uh, uh, patients and colleagues uh, of his. Uh, I wish uh, all of our uh, listeners a uh, happy Memorial Day uh, weekend. Uh, stay uh, healthy and we will see you next week. Thank you very much.